Greetings, my name is Ryan Nix. I'm a solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. Joining me here today is Eduardo. Hi Ryan, I'm Eduardo. I'm also a solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. Welcome. Eduardo, recently we've been talking to a lot of customers around planning analytics, how they're utilizing that to make uh, financial forecasting and, and, and planning logistical preparations. We've recently deployed a SaaS version right. of IBM Planning Analytics on AWS. Let's take a moment or two and peel back the onion and have a look at what is under the hood uh, on the new product offering and why this is sort of sure. impactful to customers. So for customers that were running Planning Analytics version 11, that's purely a VM-based installation where you have components like TM1 Web, which is a web sphere liberty based front end application that allows you to interact with the TM1 server in the back and where all the uh, analytics memory resides in memory. Uh, in memory. So we're looking at an OLAP in memory database. Uh, so purchase product from IBM, yeah. build out EC2, yes. install software onto Correct. it. These are not small EC2 instances. No, these, these are, are very uh, large. Large EC2 instances. Uh, that said, what I'm hearing is a potential for resilience problems. Yes, especially when you're dealing with the IBM TM1 server, which is an active passive uh, architecture. So you're talking about if there is a failure, there's going to be some downtime because you need to uh, persist the in-memory in data back to disk, and then you need to make sure that the standby uh, instance or your backup instance can reload that data, rebuild the, all the components in memory. So there is some concern. So, so you've got a bit of an, a high availability concern there, but you also have a, a scaling concern. It doesn't sound like the type of technology that very easily scales up or scales horizontally. Correct. Right. So many customers are over-provisioning the environment and, and, and running based on what their maximum utilization correct. is. Yes, correct. Right, so what has changed significantly with the new SaaS offering? First and foremost, it's a SaaS product, so somebody else is doing all of the operational side of it, I'm assuming. Yes, that's correct. So IBM is bringing this next generation of planning analytics as a SaaS offer. It's already available, and it will also be available as a self-managed uh, option on the AWS marketplace for customers that prefer to deploy it on their AWS account. So they have re-architectured the, the TM1 solution, the planning analytics, to basically be a containerized version of the product. I see you've got OpenShift listed over here, and it's going to build on top of the Cloud Pack for Data Correct. base. Correct. Right. So we're, as we're talking about Cloud Pack, we're definitely talking about OpenShift. So you can deploy it using uh, Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS. So you take advantage of a fully managed OpenShift cluster, and then you don't have to you know, be concerned about the day-to-day -day operations of your cluster, like patching, backups, and things like that at the cluster level, because you have Red Hat SREs and AWS supporting you. Okay, uh, basically freeing up your resources to focus on what's important to the business and exactly. not less about keeping the lights on. Exactly. Uh, that said, what are the components that are under the hood? You know, Planning Analytics brings other IBM software components. Uh, let, let's run through these. I, I don't see TM1, which was the traditional in-memory database listed here. Yeah, so, so is there, there something to replace exactly. it? So there is now this um, uh, planning analytics engine. So you see the planning analytics engine service and the planning analytics engine database. So that's what, let's say, the next generation TM1, right? Where IBM has redesigned the solution and it's no longer an active passive uh, in-memory database. So now you gain the benefits of having multiple uh, pods of that solution running inside your OpenShift in an active-active model. So multiple pods running over here and over here, and the real concept here is a improvement in resilience. Correct. And especially in the approach that IBM has taken, where it, because of the, the size of your, your, your databases can be quite large, as you said, right? So there are different machine pools that are allocated inside OpenShift for that. So when you're talking about the, the database engine, right, you're going to have a specific type of machine pool that's optimized to deal with uh, in-memory applications. So with these optimized instances, this is really 
getting away from that over provisioning, getting right. customers closer to yes. utilizing what they need and for those specialized workflows, uh, the benefit of these different instance types. Uh, the, does this change the way information workers, does this change the way that somebody using a, a, an Excel spreadsheet type interface no, to you still have their data. Yeah, you still have the Excel plugin available that you can download and install, and you continue to operate the same way. So, what went away here is the TM1 web compared to the previous version, because you have the uh, uh, planning analytics workspace dashboards that that give you all the web interface and you know the capability to interact with your TM1 data and have your web UI replacing the the, the older version. So you still have a web UI, but that's now this workspace. Over here. Yes. So this is again containerized workloads running on top of OpenShift. Yeah. So I think the big difference here is you now have much better scalability yes. coming from this because you could just literally add in more and more Kubernetes based pods, yeah. scale out as many of those front end web Scalability apps. on AWS yeah. and of OpenShift together to give you a more resilient and scalable environment. Right, uh, you've got EFS listed over here, so I'm assuming that is to provide a shared storage layer right. largely for the TM1. For the TM1, yes, because okay. now you're looking at an active-active solution, right? So you're going to need all your TM1 instances to access the data as it's persisted to disk, right? So in the older implementations and a couple of architectures that we've discussed in the past, if you had a failure, you had to... Uh, sort of eject a node from something like an auto scaling group. You then had to sort of uh, write the in memory information to persistent storage. That sounds like it has evolved, like it's been replaced by something internally in Kubernetes. Is that coming from the, the new planning analytics engine? Yes, correct. Okay. That's coming from the new planning analytics engine, so you don't have to worry about that traditional failover scenario with TM1, where you have to dump all the in-memory content to disk, replicate it across into your... Well, it still needs to happen. The yes. customer just doesn't need to solve it themselves. Exactly. It's, it's yeah. coming from the product in itself. Yeah. Uh, EBS, if I've got EFS, why do I have EBS? Where's the EBS coming? So the EBS here, is, as you have to, as you are deploying Cloud Pack for Data on, on, on Rosa, you have different options of deploying it. You can use only EFS or you can also use EBS. So it really depends on what you're using. There are certain components on Callback for Data that you can take advantage of using EBS because they don't need to be accessible across different availability zones. And also, um, the product by itself, the control plane of Callback for Data, the common services, you can go in, the, in, in a configuration that uses a combination of both storage options or you, you can just deploy it using EFS. It's totally okay. fine. A, a lot of these customers are pulling in data sources from a variety of places, different financial systems. Um, I'm, I'm assuming RDS, uh, what else is supported beyond a, a typical rela relational database? And yeah, what sure. is the connection type to it? So um, today, Planning Analytics has the capability of connecting to external data sources via ODBC IS. So any ODBC compliant database like uh, uh, Postgres um, or um, Amazon Redshift, or DB2 Warehouse, you can have DB2 Warehouse running today on AWS as well. So you can connect over ODBCIS to those data sources. Okay, and coming back to the DB2 family, you know that could be a an add-on, yeah, standalone component that you're adding into the Cloud Pack for Data, or it could now be a, a standalone marketplace correct. Yes, deployed. Correct. Correct. Uh, a solution over there. So, so we see a, a, a quite a broad variety of different input sources. As long as it's ODBC, we can connect to it and, and pull that into uh, planning analytics. From a connectivity standpoint, Transit Gateway over there, obviously to interlink all of these different VPCs, potentially coming back to on-premises on resources yeah. as well. Yeah. So very much a hybrid architecture there. Yes. What am I missing? Is there something that we haven't discussed that is potentially important? No, I think we pretty much covered everything. There's an introduction to what the next generation of planning analytics is and what it can do for you. And again, this is available today as a SaaS and will be, will be soon available also on the AWS Marketplace as a solution that you can deploy on your own AWS account. All right. Uh, thank you very much. As always, a pleasure having you here. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.